We're now moving on to primitives that allow us to guarantee that data being sent is authentic or to guarantee its integrity that it hasn't been modified, which is a big um, application area. And the primitive we're going to use is called a message authentication code. So the setup is that, as we've been seeing for a while, Alice and Bob are communicating, but the medium over which they're sending their transmissions is insecure. There's an adversary that can see and possibly modify the information that's sent across. When we studied symmetric encryption, our goal was to ensure that the adversary seeing this information doesn't result in loss of privacy of the actual data, and that's done by encrypting the data before being transmitted and decrypting at the other end under some key. Now, our goal is to ensure that if Bob gets some message M and it purports to come from Alice, maybe the it's an email and the header field says, this is Alice sending it, then that claim is really true. It really did originate with the claim sender and not someone else. Included in that is that if Alice had actually sent some message, what Bob gets is the same thing. It hasn't been modified or changed along the way. The importance of integrity and what it means are quite easy to see by a whole slew of possible examples. We could take internet banking or some kind of internet payment transaction, which is a common thing nowadays. So let's say Alice writes an electronic check. So this is just a message to her bank saying, please pay the following amount to Charlie. So the adversary Eve, if it intercepts this message along the way and has the ability to tamper with it, could wreak all kinds of damage. So for example, she could change the name of the pay to her name and thereby get her account credited. She could change the amount and make the pay uh, quite a bit richer. So integrity is about preventing all these kinds of things so that what the bank sees as the check is exactly what Alice sent and, uh, and the bank is also sure that it really was Alice who sent it. So we're going to need a crypto primitive to do this and as we've seen in the past, whenever you have a crypto primitive, it has a syntax and then some security definitions. The syntax is just what kind of algorithms make up this primitive. A, an encryption scheme, as we'd seen before, was a triple of algorithms. A PRF was a family of functions. All of these are different examples of syntax. Our primitive now, which is called a message authentication code, is in syntax actually a familiar object. It's just another family of functions. So that means it's a two-argument function. The first argument is drawn from a space of keys, and that argument is thus called the key. Then there's a second argument from some domain, and the output is in some range. How do you use this to authenticate data? We are again in the symmetric setting. So a key K will be chosen at random from the key space, and that will be shared between sender and receiver. How they get that key is for us not a concern at this point. Just think that by magic, it securely reaches the endpoints. Now, when Alice has some message or data M that she wants to send and whose integrity she wants to assure, she sends M to uh, Bob in the clear, but she accompanies it by a tag or fingerprint and this tag or fingerprint is supposed to say this ensures that this message is authentic. This is computed by applying this tagging or message authentication code function to the message under the influence of the shared key. And this simply indicates that the message tag pair that's sent out over the internet could be intercepted by an adversary who is capable of changing them. It may change the message to M prime. 
But if it does that, it also has to update the tag because at this end, there's a verification algorithm that checks that the tag and message map up and it does that using this key. And if they match up, it outputs a one to say I accept and otherwise it outputs a zero to say I reject. We refer to this thing as the MAC or tag. So how is this verification done? It's actually quite uh, simple and it's prescribed by the tagging algorithm or message authentication code, which is often also called a tagging algorithm. It just checks when it's given a candidate message and a candidate tag that if it computes the correct MAC on this message, it will have this value. So it can run the same T function with the key that it has on this message and get the real correct tag value. And if what's supplied here equals that, then it says, okay, I accept. So that's how a MAC gets used to guarantee integrity. Note that no privacy is sought or provided here. The data is actually going in the clear. At some point, we will look at getting both privacy and integrity, but at the moment, the goal is integrity without worrying about privacy. So this was the formal syntax that would just be this one algorithm, one family of functions, T. And uh, the usage that we've seen in the prior picture is summarized on this slide, which says that if the sender wants to authenticate a message, what it transmits is the message together with this tag. And then the receiver will receive a pair and check that the message is authentic by making sure that if it ran the tagging algorithm with the shared key on the received message, the tag it obtained matches the received tag. So next we need a definition of security for, for message authentication schemes. Since by now we have quite a bit of experience with games and security notions, I will just go ahead and tell you what the games are. As usual, the games abstract out the application setting. So as we go along, we'll try to fill in how that fits into the picture. The notion is called UFCMA, that stands for Unforgeability Under Chosen Message Attack. We fix a family of functions T, or message authentication code, and that's the object to security we're trying to define. As usual, it's a public object. It's usually some simple standardized algorithm that's uh, implemented, and anyone can write software for it, or usually even access software for it. And as usual, A denotes our adversary who will be the one playing the game. The game, UFCMA, is subscripted by the family of functions to indicate that this family of functions parameterizes it because that's the object to security we are measuring. And as usual, it'll export a bunch of procedures. And it's the adversary that calls these procedures. The initialized procedure, as in most symmetric primitives we've seen, begins by picking a random key from this key space over here. The key is not returned. This goes back to things like PRFs and symmetric encryption, where security requires that the key be secret and hidden from the adversary, and unlike hash functions where that key is revealed to the adversary. There's some bookkeeping here that the adversary is not really concerned with, initializing some set to empty. The, when the adversary plays this game, it will of course be trying to win the game in some way. So let's look ahead to that because that's the core target for the adversary. What the adversary's goal is, is to come up with a pair, a message and a tag. And it wins simply if these are correct in the sense that this tag is the correct tag for this message relative to this MAC function and this key. In other words, what finalize does is it takes this as input and then computes the result of the MAC function with this key on this message. And if the tag matches that, it says, okay, you win. So it returns the Boolean true in that case. And otherwise, if this test fails, it returns false. What this represents in an application 
is the adversary going to Bob the receiver and submitting to it this message and this tag and saying, look, this is what Alice said. Alice said sent this message and this is the correct tag for it. And Bob would perform this verification check and if Bob accepts, then the adversary has won because Alice hasn't really sent this. It's actually the adversary who created it. So effectively, you can think of finalizers representing the receiver from an application perspective. There's some additional checks over here. Uh, for Just for completeness, we make sure that the message is in the domain of the Mac. That should usually be implicit. It, it doesn't even make sense to apply this function when the message is not in this domain, but sometimes for completeness, we, we throw it into the game. Okay, that represents the receiver side. Now, in its quest to find this message and tag pair that fools the receiver, the adversary has a resource. The resource is it can go to Alice and see messages that Alice sends out together with their correct tags. These are simply Alice's communications to Bob, which are legitimate. The game formally captures that by giving the adversary access to an oracle called tag. In this game, it's the adversary that gets to pick what message is tagged. In the real life rendition, you can somehow imagine that this adversary is able to go to Alice and say, hey, you know, I'd really like to break your scheme for that would be very useful for me if you showed me how to tag the following message M. And for some reason, Alice says, sure, here's the tag of M. So we are trying to model or capture a situation as bad as that. So the adversary goes to this tag oracle, submits the message M, and what the game does is it simply runs the tagging function or message authentication code on the shared key on the given message M to get a tag, and it returns that tag to the adversary. The adversary can call this many times. It will collect tags for a whole slew of messages chosen to help it to come up finally with this forgery here, some message and correct tag for it. Now, if that is how the game is or all that it is, we might note that there's a very trivial way for the adversary to win. What it can do is submit a message M here, get the tag, and then here submit the same message and tag. Of course, this will be true because it's been computed to be true. But clearly, that's not actually a forgery. Why is that? Because implicitly, if the tag oracle has produced this tag on this message, we're saying Alice has sent this message, meaning she's willing to send it, and it's actually authentic. If Bob accepts that message, nothing has gone wrong. He's just accepted something Alice really sent. So to make sure that the winning condition for the adversary is something non-trivial, we have this set S. And what it does is it simply records all messages that have been tagged by this through this oracle, or in other words, all messages Alice actually sent or agreed to tag. And then here, to win, it must be the case that the message that the adversary submits to finalize or outputs in our formalism is not in the set S. If it is in the set S, the game says, sorry, you don't win. So to win, it has to choose a new message. Okay, so the one line summary of this is that you get to see as an adversary legitimate tags of messages of your choice and you win if you can create the tag of a message that's new, meaning not one of the ones whose tags you've seen. When the adversary plays this game, it can win or lose. There will be some probability it wins and that's its advantage. Here, as usual, the superscript is the name of the notion, unfortunately, and the chosen message attack. Subscript is the Mac function whose security we're measuring, and the argument is the adversary. And every time you change the adversary, you could get a different advantage. And this indicates that the game is played with this adversary. These are just verbal um, explanations written down so that you uh, have a second chance to kind of see it in print. Um, 
some things worth remembering from this. The adversary does not a priori get the key. If it got the key, it would be way too easy to forge tags and kind of meaningless. The tag oracle represents what we call a chosen message attack, and that's this component of the name. And what that says is adversaries can not only see tags of messages that Alice sent, but they even get to influence those messages to the extreme point that they can choose them. One might argue that that's a little implausible in real life, but the idea is to have a worst case conservative metric of security. So we allow the adversary to do this and seek security, even if it has that capability. And in fact, capabilities like that are not that far off in real applications. To win, this adversary must create an, or output a message and a correct tag for it. Correct means that if you apply the tagging function under this key to the message, you get this. And the second condition is new. New means that this wasn't a message in the set of those whose tags the adversary already requested. And if you want to back up from the formalism to usage, remember the tag oracle represents the sender the finalized oracle represents the receiver. And so what we're saying with security is that the adversary can't get the receiver to accept a message that is not authentic. Authentic is defined as something that was actually transmitted by the sender. So now we have a definition. We can start thinking about how we might uh, build um, tagging functions, message authentication codes that actually achieve this. And towards that, there's a few things to understand about the security metric. So here's a small uh, piece of that. If the tags being created by the message authentication code, meaning its outputs are too short, then you will not have security. So what this says is that whenever the tags are L bits long, you can easily create an adversary that has a success probability of 1 and 2 to the L. And it's left as an exercise to see how to do that, but you can see that if L is like 2, that means you have a very quickly have a 1 in 4 chance of forgery, and that's way too high for security. So you would expect tag lines to be long, for example, at least 80 bits. It turns out for most Macs in practice, they're even longer than that, and we'll see a little bit about why. So let's turn to examples. Let's try to build a message authentication code. We know by now that we're not going to get very far if we just try to come up with some ad hoc thing that we invent on the fly. And that the way cryptographers do these things is they exploit their atomic primitives. So again, we go back to block ciphers. These were our main atomic primitive. And we ask, assuming we have a good block cipher, say a PRF secure one, how do I create from it a message authentication code? So I'll let E represent the block cipher, for example, AES and uh, B the space of blocks. So for AES, that's the set of all strings of length 128. As often in usages of block ciphers, the message is viewed as a sequence of blocks. And I'll assume it's thus that its length is a, is a multiple of the block length. So now we want to define our Mac, and we call this particular construction the CBC or Cypher Block Chaining Mac. We have earlier seen CBC encryption. It's not the same thing, but it has a similar name because the underlying construction, as you'll see, has many similarities. So how does the construction go? We take this long multi-block message M, and we've broken it into blocks and we want to create a short tag authenticating this message. So we run the first block through the block cipher with our hidden key, which is also the key for the message authentication code. And um, what comes out, we XOR into the second message block and run the block cipher again with the same key. And we just keep doing this until the message is exhausted. And the last block that we output is, these, is the MAC or tag value or the CBC Mac in this case. So the code would look like this. You initialize this chaining variable to zero, and then you keep updating it as the result of the block cipher 
to the current message block plus the prior value of the chaining variable and the last uh, value here is returned. Unlike encryption, there's no initial vector or something like that being returned. You return a short output, which is for AES just 128 bits, and it's this value over here. So that was quite nice and simple to define. Um, does it work? Well, it would be nice if it did, but perhaps not too surprisingly, the fact is that there is an attack on it. And this attack is good to illustrate a little bit about how we um, visualize and think about unforgeability. And it's also interesting because the attack works regardless of the strength of the block cipher. You could have a perfectly good block cipher and the problem is not coming from it, but from the way we did this chaining. So to give the attack, um, let's first recall the scheme. I just put the scheme code here so that we have it on this slide. And also recall the security game and metric. We have to build an adversary violating UFCMA. So it's allowed to call its tag oracle, perhaps multiple times, although here we'll only need it to be called once. And then it has to output a message in tag pair that are correct with the message being new. So what we have to think about then is how do I create a correct tag for some message? Am I actually allowed to pick that message in any way I want? But I have to create a correct tag for it. And the difficulty is I don't know the key. So I can't run this algorithm because I have no idea what the key is. But nonetheless, I want to compute the tag. Okay, well, if you have nothing else to go on, that seems kind of impossible. However, we do have something. We have a tagging oracle. And so we can submit to it some message and we'll submit a one block message X. Doesn't matter what X is. Um, I picked it arbitrarily over here. And we'll get back a tag. So as an adversary, we submit X and we get back a tag. Now, looking at the algorithm, we see that if you have a one block message, so N is just one, what does this do? It just applies the block cipher to this, which is zero, plus that message block. So all you're doing is you're enciphering with the block cipher this value x. In other words, this t1 is what your adversary will get back. Okay, now maybe you would ask yourself, can I come up with e sub k on some other point y or something like that? That would be rather difficult, um, in particular because e is a PRF. But this adversary instead does is it constructs a certain very specific two-block message. It, the first block of the message is x. The second is x XORed with the value here. This is a value the adversary knows. It got it back from its tagging oracle. It now uses that as part of the data, and it puts this here as the second block of the message. Let's see what the CBC MAC of that is. As per the code, what will happen is that if you try to MAC this message, this part will go through as before, this will get XORed into here, and then we'll encipher again. And now we see the point of doing this. When this gets XORed into here, the T1s go away, and all you have is an X going into here. Why did the adversary do this? Because it knows what happens if the block cipher is run with key K on input X. It knows that you'll get T1 because that's what happened earlier. So the adversary can predict that T1 comes out here. So now the attack is go to the tagging oracle with some X and get T1, create this two block message, first block X, second block T1 plus X, output that two block message, and claim that the same T1 here is a correct tag of it. And this picture or this little uh, set of equations here showed that this works. In other words, this, uh, this adversary will correctly violate um, uh, UFCMA and it will have an advantage in this game of one. Furthermore, it's very practical. And so the basic CBC MAC is actually not um, unforgeable under chosen message attack. Now, one can discuss those things, um, uh, this one a little bit more. It turns out that it's rather important that this adversary 
asked for the tag of a one block message and forged on a two block message. If we restrict usage to messages whose blocks are always, which always have the same number of blocks, for example, you're only allowed to authenticate four block messages, then the basic CBC Mac actually works fine. But that's not a very realistic um, application setting. In practice, you expect that message lengths will vary. So maybe interesting to see what people say about the CBC Mac in practice. This is a blog maintained by a, a well-known applied cryptographer, Matt Green, and uh, he's outspoken and here he tells you why he hates the CBC Mac. And, uh, and the, what he says is that uh, there's nothing really wrong with it when implemented correctly, but the problem is that people implement it incorrectly. And it's, it's interesting to read this. It's a bit of an alternative perspective, but it tells you, for example, recall that when we defined the CBC Mac, I assumed that the message had length a multiple of the block length of the block cipher. In practice, of course, that doesn't happen. And so um, people need to do something about that. So that can be one source of problems. This effectively points to the attack we had. This, the variable length messages uh, are not handled. In fact, the, this, it's, it becomes insecure in that case. Um, it's also the case that when your message has length, something not a multiple of the block length, you have to do something. And this effectively is the, the attack we showed. He talks about how sometimes people start using random initialization vectors, but that's not what you're supposed to do. That's not what the description of the algorithm says. And a whole slew of other interesting things. And, uh, and he has a strong conclusion. This uh, post over here on Stack Exchange is just showing you what kind of confusions arise about the CBC Mac and what people are thinking. With uh, the information you have, you can often answer questions like this. So, for example, this person is saying, I understand the reason for CBC Mac not to have a random IV is if it does, the attacker can make this change or something like that. Um, but uh, it's not terribly clear what this question uh, means and uh, the answers speak to that a little bit. So this is also a good exercise to kind of think about how you might answer a question like that. This um, exercise goes to the heart of what made the CBC Mac that we saw fail. So our splicing attack very crucially exploited that the usage of the Mac allowed variable length messages. So it was defined, the message authentication clause was defined for messages of arbitrary length. And this allowed the attacker to first obtain the tag of a one block message and then forge on a two block message. And as I mentioned briefly earlier, if we restricted message length to just one fixed value, then the CBC Mac actually works just fine. So knowing that, what this says is let's find a way to incorporate the message length into the design so as to avoid these attacks. And the idea here is that when you get this message M to tag, we are now defining a new tagging algorithm, but very similar to the CBC Mac. You first, as usual, parse your message into M blocks, but then you create a new block, and this new block is simply the length of the message. More precisely, it's the number of blocks in the message written as a binary string that's one block long. And now what you return as the Mac of this is to run the CBC Mac on this extended data, which has this block appended to it. And um, the hope is that by doing this, by incorporating the length in this way, you will have stopped the prior attacks. What this exercise is actually asking to show is it's actually not that simple. 
So this, this um, design doesn't work. Now, there are ways to make this work, to do something with the length so that um, you do get security. But it's interesting to see that it's not entirely obvious how to do that. And plus, this gives you some practice with the uh, notion. We will eventually go on to see a bunch of secure Macs. But uh, before we get there, it may be worth discussing some an aspect of the usage which the definition seems a little bit silent about, and that's replay. So suppose that you're in a banking type setting and Alice sends a message to her bank consisting of data M1 and some tag T1 to authenticate the data. And the data is something like, you know, pay a certain amount to somebody. And suppose your adversary captures this message as it goes by. Well, the fact that you have authenticated it with this tag means your adversary can't modify this message and then make Bob accept it. But what if it it's a, decides not to modify it at all? It simply retransmits that message to the bank. Depending on how the application at the bank end is implemented, it um, has possibly no way to tell that this is a retransmission. It just sees this as another check coming in for Bob from Alice, and it's a correctly signed and tagged check. So the result is it'll simply credit Bob's account with another $100, and a continuous retransmission makes Bob richer and richer. So how then is this something reflected in the way we are looking at and measuring security? It's, it's not. If you look at our unforgeability and the chosen message attack notion, it says that the only way for the adversary to win is with a correct message tag pair where uh, the message is new. It's something which is not in the set S and, the, and that means that the sender has not previously tagged it. So retransmission is simply not viewed by the formalism as victory for the adversary. What this says, however, is why not? In real life, it is victory for the adversary. The answer is not that we don't care about this stuff, but rather that it reflects a kind of modular approach to design. It turns out to be more convenient to address replay as a kind of add-on on top of standard message authentication than to try to factor it directly into our base definition. And so let's illustrate that by seeing how we would protect against replay given as a tool a message authentication code that meets our UFCMA definition that in itself doesn't protect against replay. So there's a couple of ways of doing it. One is timestamps. So what Alice does is that when she transmits her message M, she of course appends as usual the Mac to make sure nobody can modify M and get Bob to accept. But now she also includes the time. From her local clock, she says, okay, I've sent this at this particular time. And when Bob receives a transmission, of course, he has to check that the Mac is correct and rejects otherwise. But he also checks that the time at which he received the transmission is the same or close to the time at which it was sent. So he looks at the timestamp here he also looks at his own clock to get this and wants to make sure that they're close enough. Now here, due to different network transmission delays and all kinds of things, you have to decide what you mean by close enough. So some small threshold will be chosen. And of course, if your adversary can get in under that threshold, it will be able to mount replay attacks. But um, fine, let's, let's think that it's possible to choose a small enough threshold that Bob gets it in time and the replays are a little bit behind that. So this is something you could try. So does it work or not? And almost, but actually we forgot one thing, which is that the time including here could be changed when the adversary sends its replay. So what happens is that the adversary gets this triple over here. Now when she retransmits, she copies the message and tag, 
but she doesn't copy the time. Instead, she puts the current time and then retranslates. And of course, if she puts the current time, it will be okay by Bob's clock. And a little bit later, she can do it again, updating the time to the new current time and so on. So in fact, we haven't accomplished security against replay. But the fix here is quite clear, is that you have to also authenticate the timestamp. So what happens is what Alice sends here is the, the message and a tag that covers not only the data, but also the timestamp. So now the adversary can't change this timestamp over here, and now it's doing, well, what we hoped it would do. There's another method that's used to prevent replay, uh, in part because timestamps are a little difficult to deal with at a systems level, which is that Alice and Bob maintain a shared counter, shared in the sense that it's assumed or they try to make sure it stays in sync, but of course they each have local copies of it, counter sub A and counter sub B, that start out zero. When Alice sends a message M, she attaches a tag. The tag is not just on her message, but on the current counter value. And once that's been done, she increments her counter. So she never twice uses the same counter value. Okay, Bob receives a message and tag. What does he do? He checks the tag, but that means he computes the tagging function on the message received here and his current value of the counter. If Alice and Bob are uh, communicating correctly, these will be in sync and counter sub B would have equal counter sub A, so Bob would accept and otherwise he would reject. And when he's done, he also increments the counter. So what this means is that if an adversary tries to retransmit, uh, what can she do? She could try to use a prior counter value that won't work because Bob's counter has gone past that and so the Mac will no longer verify even if the adversary had copied one that did. She could try to use a future or upcoming counter value. If she could do that, it would be fine because Bob would accept, but she doesn't know how to create the Mac for that. So in both ways, it's not quite going to work out. Okay, but uh, even these have some problems. It's not that easy to maintain synchronous counters. You can worry about what happens if a packet is dropped on the network and uh, various other things. So it's not clear there are perfect solutions to replay. In any case, uh, our takeaway from that is that we have some sense of how we deal with replay and given that we're now going to forget about it and we're going to agree that unforgeability and a chosen message attack is the notion of interest for us. So with that, where did we leave off? We saw the CBC Mac, but while it was a nice candidate approach, it actually failed to work. It wasn't secure. So we're still seeking, we're still seeking a secure design. It turns out that there's quite a lot of different ways to get secure Macs. And one way to unify all of those is by seeing that we've already solved in some sense a harder problem perhaps not solved it at least, but we've already given a, a definition of a goal that is uh, a security property stronger than the one we want here. In a, and the claim saying that is that any pseudorandom function f is in fact unforgeable in the chosen message attack. So formally, let f be some family of functions. And that's just a syntactic definition that says it takes as input a key and an ordinary input and as an output. Now for the same f, we can consider many different security metrics. We can talk of it being a PRF, we can talk of it being UFCMA secure, we can even talk of it as being collision resistant, although that's not um, going to be something we do here. So our claim now is that if we know that f is PRF secure, Automatically, we know that it's also UFCMA secure. So PRFs are good max. How is that captured in this statement? Well, it's one of these theorems in the provable security style. Assume you're given an adversary trying to violate UFCMA security. That means it plays the UFCMA game. It has access to a tag oracle. 
and we quantify how many queries it makes to that tag oracle as Q. It also has some running time and we'll call that T. So it'll trundle along, make these queries and finally go output something and it wins if finalized thinks that that's a successful correct Mac which is new. So what this says is given this adversary A, we want to somehow say that its success in violating UFCMA is not too big. The way we do that is we construct from A another adversary B attacking the same F but with a completely different game. It's playing the PRF game. So remember in that game you're given uh, an oracle Fn and you know that it's either real or random and you're trying to decide which. So B, the claim is, will solve that problem, win its game, with roughly the same probably that A wins this game. The only thing it gives up is a small term which is growing inversely in 2 to the power n which is the size of the range space. And usually being big this is a pretty negligible term so almost something you can ignore. So the way we read this then is that if f is a good PRF this is small and hence this is small and hence f is a good Mac. It's important that we state here what the resources of the adversary B are because to be able to say that uh, this is small requires that those use resources be limited in some way. So we've seen a few of these and the uh, status with regard to how uh, what role they play in the class and your responsibility about them is the same. The expectation or hope is that you understand these things and know how to apply them but you're not responsible for proving them and nor in this class do we give formal proofs. But nonetheless it may be nice to get some intuition. Why is it that random pseudo-random functions make good message authentication codes? And especially because that intuition is actually quite easy and revealing. It consists of two observations. The first is that random functions are in fact good max. That statement is a kind of a thought experiment statement. Random functions are too big to be used in practice. There's the simply the cost of storing them is prohibitive. But we can imagine their use as max and when we do we see that they work perfectly well. But PRFs by definition are things that are basically as good as random functions in practice because nobody can tell the difference between the input output behavior of a PRF under a hidden key from that of a random function. And those are pretty high level statements but at the highest level that's why this theorem is true. If you want a little more detail in the intuition uh, for the first one suppose we have a random function so as per our games it takes inputs in this set D and it simply returns random outputs of length n. What would it mean for an adversary to try to violate UFCMA here? It would query this function which is now the tag oracle at some number of points and then it would have to forge the value of the function or the value of the tag at some new point. So the adversary obtains Fn on x1 through xq and then there's some x outside that set and the adversary is trying to figure out the value of Fn on that. And we ask how likely it is to do that. And the answer is that, well, it just can't. This is just an absolute fact. It's not based on some assumption or anything like that. But a random function is going to return a random value on any point. If x is a point on which has not yet been queried, we have no idea what's coming out. It'll just be some random point. So if the adversary outputs x without having queried it, there's only a 1 and 2 to the n chance that the tag it outputs with x is the correct one. And the uh, second claim at the very highest level, the intuition is suppose that we play the UFCMA game with our PRF used in the, as the message authentication code and suppose the adversary has a very high chance of winning that game. But we already know that that would not happen if we had used a random function. What that tells us is we're just seeing some difference in how uh, in the behavior 
of uh, of f with a fixed key and a random function and the difference in behavior is that the probability of a winning the ufcma game changes a lot we can measure that and thus that that would give us an adversary b violating prf security okay so that was just some sort of um, very high level intuition it's uh, may or may not be be useful but what you should remember is the theorem statement so um, now still continuing we actually yet don't actually have a mac we don't have a secure mac so what we've done however is reduce the problem to building prs we may as well look at that problem now one may say but we already have prs in particular block ciphers were things we were willing up to the birthday attack to assume is a prf so why aren't we done well the reason is that block ciphers have fixed length inputs and a message authentication code needs to be able to handle large variable length inputs so this problem being quite general it's uh, it has a name and the problem is called domain extension what it means is you are given a way to uh, authenticate or tag short messages or in other words you're given a prf that works when the data is of some fixed length say drawn from the set of all strings of some length l and you want to construct another prf that is where has variable input length what that means is its domain is some large set for example the set of all strings or at least the set of all strings whose length is a multiple of some underlying block length or maybe at least a very large set of strings up to some very large maximum length so this is the problem we'll now consider given a prf like aes that has uh, good security for fixed input lengths construct a prf that's secure for variable input lengths and when we do that by the prior result we'll have our mac so there's a number of ways to do this and uh, in fact the cbc mac we saw is a candidate construction it does try to construct a variable input length function from a fixed input length one it's just that it, it failed it didn't work uh, so now we'll see a couple of other ways that do work these are just a few of many many things out there these are the encrypted cbc mac and hmac so the encrypted cbc mac as the name says is very similar to the cbc mac what's it trying to do is just trying to solve the problem underlying the splicing attack it's trying to make sure that that type of thing doesn't is impossible so how does it work well as with the cbc mac we start with a block cipher so it has k bit keys inputs from some space of blocks b which is a string of all set of all strings of length some n n could be 128 if you're using aes and then we're going to build the uh, family of functions which is our message authentication code called the encrypted cbc mac unlike the cbc mac the key is not just the block cipher key but two block cipher keys so formally the key length is twice the key length of uh, of e and it takes inputs from this set i have defined this set to be the set of all strings whose um, length is a multiple of little n so it's all strings that can be written as some sequence of blocks and the picture shows how it works you have your message m here you break it into blocks and you first start running the cbc mac now you have two keys for the block cipher so we call them k in and k out and when you do this you use k in so you do exactly the same as a cbc mac you run this through uh, e sub e with k in get some output chain it into here xor run it through again this point here is the cbc mac under key k in the encrypted cbc mac doesn't stop there however it simply adds one more step it re-encrypts that with the block cipher but using its second key and that value is the final mac so if you look at the pseudocode this shows you that there are these 
two keys, formerly a single key written with two parts. And then um, it, this computation here is the CBC Mac. So when we're done, CM is the CBC Mac. And now you re-encrypt that under K out. And that gives you your final tag. OK, well, this is a simple enough change. But um, at some level, it, it, it works. It's good. And we'll see that um, in a little bit. But uh, as we start investigating whether it works or not, we encounter a phenomena that's general enough that we may as well pause to, to talk about it first. We've seen birthday attacks in many contexts. So we've seen them in the PRF context against block ciphers. We saw how they violated privacy of uh, modes of operation of a block cipher. Well, perhaps unsurprisingly, um, they show up also in message authentication. And it turns out that many Macs, including the encrypted CBC Mac and HMAC that we'll see later, are subject to birthday attacks. And these attacks, unlike for hash functions which find collisions or for encryption which violate INDCPA, they have now violate unforgeability under chosen message attack. So they break the construct as a message authentication code. And that shows you how versatile the birthday attack is. It's capable of doing many different things. The bottom line is that the number of tag queries you need to mount the attack is about two to the power half of the output length of the Mac. So if you consider the CBC Mac with AES, and it has an output length of 128, the attack would take time to do the 64. Of course, for the CBC Mac itself, it's pointless because there was a better attack. But for the encrypted CBC Mac, it's the same. The output length is still 128, so you still have a 2 to the 64 query attack to, to break UFCMA. The good news is that this is often the best possible, and there are theorems to show that for individual constructions. And so the birthday bound becomes the actual indication of security. Now, this attack and this type of theorem isn't true for every Mac, but the attacks work on a large class of Macs, which we call iterated ones. And uh, most of the things we'll see do fall in that class. So I won't tell you how the attack works. It's, it's, it's fairly interesting. It's not uh, obvious how to do it. But if you want to play around, you can look at it throughout through this exercise. So with that, we're ready to say what is known about the security of the encrypted CBC Mac. And this is the theorem. The summary is simply that uh, it's good. And it's good in the quantitative sense that the birthday attack is best possible. The birthday attack is a nuisance, but it's not deadly because we can simply pick the output length large enough that it becomes prohibitive. So the theorem quantifies all this and says it in terms of reduction. So let's see what it says. So here we are simply saying we have a, a family of functions E, and we let F be the corresponding encrypted CBC Mac. And of, its code is, as before, is given by this. Now, although an important point of interest is its UFCMA security, I'm simply going to show that it's a PRF, because we know that PRFs are UFCMA secure, and so this is only a stronger claim. So the way that's done is we'll assume we are given a PRF adversary against F, and we'll show that its advantage can't be too big. Of course, this advantage will depend on the number of Oracle queries it makes and other resources. And the resources of interest are beyond the number of Oracle queries, the total length of them all, or more precisely, the total number of blocks across these queries where each block is uh, n bits long. And of course, the running time of our adversary. Remember that this adversary is playing the PRF game. So it's talking to either the real or random game, and it's trying to figure out which. What the theorem now says is that if you want to bound this advantage achieved by A against this F, you can do that by translating A into some other adversary D 
that violates security of the given family of functions E. So it says that effectively any way to violate PRF security of F is underlain implicitly by some way to violate PRF security of the family of functions E itself. And this is how security is being transferred from E to F. The term here is the unpreventable birthday attack advantage, and here it's, it's quite big. It grows quadratically in the number of blocks that F queries to its oracle. But inversely, in the number of possible outputs of the family of functions, and that's where the output length plays a role. If I pick this number n to be big enough, then uh, this becomes negligible. As usual, the way you read this is that assume E is a PRF, then this number is small, so this number is small, so F is also a PRF. So um, let's see quantitatively what this theorem means for, for security. This is a illustration of how if you needed a Mac in practice and you wanted to make a choice among the many ones available, how would you go, out do, uh, go about doing that? Well, what it says is that you would first ask yourself in your user or application, what do you think are the adversary resources? You would get those by thinking, how many messages do I want to encrypt and what length do they have? And that will allow you to set the Q and Sigma parameters. And uh, then given that, you, you would look at different Macs and see what the theorem told you about the adversary advantage and, uh, and see what you'd like to pick. We're going to be looking here not only at Macs we've talked about, but some that are upcoming. We may as well do the comparison right away. And also for simplicity, I'm going to assume that all messages have the same length. So all of them have length m, or more precisely have m blocks. And the punchline then from, if you look at the formulas from the prior slide, is that you can safely authenticate about 2 to the power half of the block length divided by this length many messages. So you're trying to authenticate as many messages as possible. At some level, you start off seeing that that number will be 2 to the power half of the block length of the block cipher. However, if the messages are longer, you can encrypt fewer of them safely. So the number of messages you can encrypt goes down with the length of the messages and up with the length of the output of the, of the MAC. So now we can look at what these parameters are in specific cases. Let's take the encrypted CBC MAC, which in principle by this theorem uh, is actually a solid, good PRF slash MAC construction. But if we use DES as the block cipher, then the block length and output length is only 64. You see that even with relatively short messages, 1024 blocks each, you can only encrypt about 2 to the 22 before you hit the birthday bound and, and it's no longer secure. If you switch DES to AES with the same MAC, the output length, the, the block length of the block cipher being 128, and for the same length of messages encrypted, you see a pretty big jump in how many messages you can safely encrypt. So this is a pretty practical number. What the third row illustrates is stay with the AES ECBC MAC, but let's assume your data was consisted of longer messages you can now see that the number you can safely encrypt is starting to drop. When you go to HMAC, the output lengths are very big. HMAC uses a hash function inside it. It could be either SHA-1, SHA-256, whatever you like, and its output length is the output length of the hash function. So that would be 160 or 256 here. Since these numbers are quite a bit bigger than the ones above, even for long messages being MACed, you can still safely MAC rather a lot, and really an astronomical number in this case, at least according to the theorem. So this can hopefully guide some choices. Well, having briefly mentioned HMAC there, this brings us to that. The history behind this is that when 
message authentication was first started, it was done with block ciphers. At that time, DES was the only really uh, popular block cipher around, so they were doing CBC or encrypted CBC Max based on DES. But then in the early 90s, the hash function started coming in. And their goal at first was collision-resistant hashing. But what people noticed is that these things are quite a bit faster than DES, at least in software. And they also realized that we need to do a lot of message authentication at the level of every packet on the internet. So speed was getting to be crucial. And it was natural to ask, well, why can't we use hash functions to produce max? Okay, it's a good idea, but there's a fundamental limitation. Remember, practical hash functions like the MD and SHA series are actually keyless. Now, our formalism allowed a key, but that's not terribly relevant here because we always gave the key to the adversary. So, and then the practical hash functions in any case didn't even have such a key. So the question that emerged from this was, how do we key hash functions? Can we somehow put secret keys into them in such a way that we get secure max? It's not hard to come up with a way to do that. And here's the most obvious thing to do. And this was a proposal on the mailing lists in which this problem was being debated in the early 90s. Take your hash function like MD5 or SHA1 or whatever. It can take data of extremely long or almost arbitrary lengths and it has n bits of output. Now I want to construct a message authentication code. So I want to construct a T that takes a key K and some data N and produces a tag out of it. How do I do that? I just prepend the key to the message and then I run the hash function. Okay, that's a perfectly appropriate and uh, well-defined scheme. I have a family of functions here. It's a keyed family of functions. And I can now start asking, does it work? Is this UFCMA or PRF secure? And the answer to this is interesting from the perspective of cryptographic knowledge, because if you simply think about the hash function as some blob, this looks very secure. It turns out it's not, but the reason it's not goes back to how these hash functions are designed. In particular, we saw that they use what we call the MD transform, which was a particular way of iterating a compression function that's internal to the hash function. And if you knew that, you would see that you can exploit it to get an attack. So it shows you that uh, a little bit of knowledge about how things work inside can be quite useful to figure out whether something works. So let's see the attack. Uh, let's look at how the hash function would compute the MAC on some message. Uh, it would break the message into blocks, so the message is now M1 through Mn. And we know that when you hash, you are going to be iterating this compression function. According to the definition here, we prepend the key to the message. From the point of view of the hash function, all that is just data. It doesn't know that the first part is a key. It's just part of the data or message from the point of view of the hash function. And for simplicity, we'll assume that the key is one block long. Now, if you go back to your slides and look at how MD worked, what it did is it took the compression function, it ran that with the first block of the message. Remember, from its point of view, all this is the message. And some initial vector that was set by the design in possibly different ways, got something here and kept going. It grabbed the next message block and then ran the compression function again and so on. Also remember that the MD transform uses as a last block the number of blocks in the message. What's the message from its perspective? All of this. So if our message is m blocks long, this will be m plus one to account for this first block. All we have said here is this is what the tagging function outputs. This is h of k concat n. So now we can look at this and say, okay, how do we find an attack? Well, we're in the UFCMA setting. So I can run the tagging oracle, call the tagging oracle on some m of my choice, which I say m blocks, 
and I can obtain this value here. So I can assume I have this, and my job is to create h of k and some other m. Any m other than m, the one here will do. The observation is that run the compression function one more time with this as a starting point for the bottom input and the integer m plus 2 as the top input. Now look at this whole thing, the whole picture. What do you see there? Well, all that this has done is it said, think of all this as data. This is the length of that data, m plus 2 blocks. So this is a valid hash computation on all of this data. Since the key is the first block, this is simply the hash of k and m prime, where m prime is m together with this stuff over here m being this. But this then is a forgery because I have the hash of k and some other m prime. This is a succinct rendition of the um, formula. It just says you compute h on k and m prime by applying the compression function to m plus 2 and h on k and m. Now, I'll leave it to you to, as an exercise to write the pseudocode adversary corresponding to this attack. Remember for this that little h is completely public. It's part of the description of the hash function. Of course, big h is also completely public. Everyone knows that the design works in this way. The only thing secret is the key, but this is computing a tag without finding the key, and that's why it ends up being successful. Okay. So that didn't work very well. Um, and you probably can guess now how the story goes after that. Often we've seen how things start out not working well. We've often thought that maybe the answer is let's do something completely different. But it's not. The answer is that we need a little but appropriately made change. And this led to HMAC. HMAC is one of the Internet's most popular PRFs and message authentication codes, and you use it every day uh, multiple times when you use TLS, which you do on almost every website. So the problem is trying to solve is the same. We start with some hash function like MD5 or SHA1. This hash function is unkeyed, and we want to construct a message authentication code. We assume this hash function is defined through the MD transform, but we don't want that as with the prior uh, suggestion to yield some kind of attack. So there's a few things we have to define here. We n is the bit length of the output of the hash function. Um, and with the MD transform, remember that messages uh, for that were being hashed, things in D, were broken into a sequence of blocks. So I'm going to let b be the byte length of the block. In most designs, it's 512 bits. So that corresponds to 64 bytes. Okay. So b is quite a bit larger than the output length. Say as an example, we're de dealing with MD5. This n is 128, but b is 512 in bits and 64 in bytes. We're going to define a couple of constants. One of them is take the byte 36 and repeat it b times, and the other is take the byte 5c and repeat it b times. Okay, and then here's the design. This hash function will take an n bit key. So the key is uh, in this version has length the same as the output length. More generally, actually, HMAC can take a key of any length. It just hashes it first. How does it work? It's very similar to the encrypted CBC MAC. What it does is it says, remember that old MAC that didn't work. Let's just do that. We'll take a key, prepend it to the message, and we'll run the hash function. And that gives us our old MAC, which we call X. But that was not a good MAC. If we output that, the adversary can forward stuff. So let's just encrypt it or do it again. We stick another key in front of that and reapply the hash function. And that's it. That's what's called HMAC. So what is the key K then? It would have to be able to specify both of these keys. Now, it doesn't 
use two independent values for these keys. Instead, this key is, is n bits long. And then the two the keys here and here called the internal and out, out, the inner key and the outer key are formed by taking this key, appending a bunch of zeros to make it of length equal to a block, and then adding in the pads we saw on the prior slide. The intent is that ki and k0 are now different keys because those two padding blocks are different. And then you do this, and that's it. That's how you get um, HMAC. Um, we can look at uh, um, many elements of it. Um, perhaps we can start with uh, um, a calculator. So by now, most crypto primitives, you can go on the internet, and you can find a tool that computes it for you. So here, for example, it says, compute HMAC. Well, HMAC uses a hash function. So first you have to select a hash function. So let's say I select, select SHA-256. Then um, here you type in whatever text you want to hash. Um, whatever. And then your key, um, I think you can just use anything because it'll be hashed down to the appropriate length. And let's see what happens. So it gave us a MAC value. Not much you can do looking at it, but okay, it works. So what else do we have? So this is the internet standard for HMAC. It's an RFC, and RFC is technically called a request for comments, but it's, uh, it's the way in which the IETF uh, gets its standards out. So this shows the description of the algorithm and uh, uh, give some test vectors and so forth. And based on this, people have implemented it in um, many, many different places. You can see a lot of curiosity about it. Here is a question coming up on Quora where someone asks, how secure is it to use HMAC with SHA-1? Now, why would they be asking that? Because SHA-1 is a broken hash function. So what happens when you use HMAC with SHA-1? And there's a fairly nuanced answer over here about what the implications of the SHA-1 attacks are and so forth. This is a nice thing to study because it's exactly the kind of thing you should be able to take away and be able to deal with. If someone asked you, what about HMAC with SHA-1, should I use it or not? Then from what you know in the class, you would hopefully be able to give some kind of answer. Anyway, so going on to the status of HMAC, uh, it has many nice features. Among them is that it only requires black box queues of software for the hash function. You simply invoke H on two different inputs, and so you don't have to re-implement much. You just call the hash function twice, and it inherits the speed of the hash function. And due to these features and, of course, security, it became extremely popular. So it was used as for both message authentication and as a PRF for things like key derivation in TLS. What do we know about its security? Well, it is one of these iterated Macs. So as we saw some slides back, it is subject to the birthday attack violating UFCMA. But the output sizes are large enough that this is not much of a problem. And there is a security proof. There's something showing, just like for the encrypted CBC Mac, some kind of reduction-based proof saying that nothing better than the birthday attack is possible, of course, under some appropriate assumptions on the primitives. And deployment is very wide. So it's, it's in TLS, in um, other secure protocols for internet communication. It's also in wireless secure communication standards and so forth. The story of HMAC from the point of view of security is kind of um, interesting with regard to the interaction between theory and practice in crypto. So it may be worth just talking about that at a high level. And in particular, it tells us how this played out relative to the attacks on hash functions. So when HMAC was first proved to be a secure PRF, of course, you have to assume something about the underlying primitives. You're not going to get P1 
PRF security from nothing. The assumptions they made, let's look at the second one first, is that the hash function is collision resistant. If you look at that assumption, anyone would say, oh, well, of course, that's what the hash function is supposed to do, fine. They also made a new assumption. They said, look at the compression function and think of it as a two argument function, as a family of functions, where the chaining variable is a key. It makes sense to ask whether that's a PRF or not, meaning when the key is hidden, does it have the PRF property? And we're going to assume it does. And under those two assumptions, we can show that HMAC actually is a PRF. And that was a nice piece of um, uh, justification that was accepted quite broadly. But then there was a difficulty, which is that as we saw by the early to mid 2000s, these hash functions were being broken. So attacks were showing that they were actually not collision resistant and people were able to find collisions. One of the most immediate questions from that is what happens to HMAC with those hash functions? Both HMAC MD5 and HMAC SHA-1 were widely deployed and widely used and people needed to know did they work or not. So if you look at the attacks on the hash functions, the fact is there doesn't seem to be any way to extend them to break the security of HMAC with the same hash function. HMAC is a different object and a different goal. Its goal is UFCMA, not collision resistance. The attacks violate collision resistance. HMAC has a secret key. The collision resistance game doesn't. So it's not obvious at all that those attacks would lift to HMAC, and in fact, they don't seem to lift. But there was nonetheless a cause for concern, which is if you go back and look at these conditions, this condition was violated. So what happens to this proof now? What happens to this theorem? Well, the theorem is true. It's, it's, it's not like the theorem has been falsified. But if a theorem makes an assumption that's false, it just becomes vacuous. Because under a false assumption, well, you can prove anything. So the theorem is just not very meaningful any longer. That meant that proof-based support for HMAC had gone away, and that made people a little bit worried. So the next step in this was that the theory was able to step back in and say, look, we can actually give a new proof. And in the new proof, this assumption is simply erased. It's not needed anymore. Security comes only from this fact. And that kind of explained what was going on. It explained why there were no attacks. The reason there were no attacks is that in the end, the collision resistance of the hash function didn't really matter. What mattered was this other property. And as long as this property holds, we have confidence that HMAC is actually good. Of course, it's still a question as to whether this property is true. As far as we know, for many hash functions, it seems to be the case, but there's no proof of that. And so you still have to be careful about all of this. Now with this, if you go back and say, okay, what does that mean the recommendations for hash functions? Just like this Quora question asked, uh, should we use HMAC with SHA-1? You could ask more generally, should we use it with MD5, whatever. The general recommendation is that even though there's no really big attack, don't use MD5 with HMAC. It's just there are too many weaknesses in MD5 to be sure there won't be an attack in the near future. HMAC with SHA-1, well, people have found collisions in SHA-1, but there still seems to be nothing wrong with the compression function pseudorandomness that would result in not trusting HMAC SHA-1. And so it's okay to use it, but nonetheless, the recommendation is if you have a choice, don't use a strong hash function, just in the interest of being conservative. Okay, so I think that ends our uh, formal part of the chapter. There's something I want to show you a little bit more. And um, this is an, uh, an illustration of something of the cryptographic community. There's a conference on cryptography held every year in Santa Barbara. And um, people meet there, and uh, there's something called a rump session at which people give impromptu talks. And often they are humorous, and this one is kind of like that. And the topic it takes up is that there's so much interest in Macs and message authentication 
that we have max for pretty much every letter of the alphabet and they're going to talk about that. We've seen how many examples here, H Mac we saw. I don't think we saw much more than that, but you can ask about other letters, but let's see what these people say. So indeed, I'm going to present you a new Mac construction called JMac into a very serious joint work with Bart Manning. Uh, so if you attended track B this morning, you might have seen Kazuhiko presenting ZMac. Z Mac, Z Mac, whatever, uh, which is a new uh, Mac and uh, the latest in a long series of uh, very imaginatively named uh, and uh, good Macs, such as H Mac, N Mac, P Mac, U Mac, V Mac. So, some designers apparently were a bit more confused about picking names for the algor algorithm because we also have the very famous Pelican Mac and Sandwich Mac. And so, empirically, it seems to be the case. That if you have a Mac algorithm with high probability, the name will be X Mac with X a letter in the Roman alphabet, or a pelican or a sandwich. And uh, but the, the problem with this thing is that the, the naming space is quite small, and this puts a lot of constraint on the design space as well. Because if you want to propose a new algorithm, well, you need to name it. And uh, now with more and more proposals, very okay. only very few names are remaining. So uh, it's not so obvious, uh, well, I mean, this begs the question, what are the names that are actually still free? So we already saw that, well, these are taken. And uh, well, but it's not all because we can play this game and well, then we have AMAC, QMAC, OMAC, FMAC, XMAC, all of these uh, serious uh, algorithms presented to prestigious conferences. Uh, so we get this uh, really random looking picture. There's no hidden image in it. Um, uh, but it goes on because we have then PMAC, MMAC, KMAC, CMAC, LMAC, which update the picture of this. And then we have BMAC, IMAC, TMAC, SMAC, DMAC. It's not quite over. We have this. So now it's we, we, only a handful of letters are still remaining, but uh, not for long because then we have WMAC, EMAC, GMAC. And here we are. We all need two letters left. Uh, so it seems that the only two possible Macs uh, that can be designed until the end of crypto are JMac and YMac. But it's not as simple because, in fact, well, it's well known that Ken Yasuda designed and analyzed many Mac algorithms. So we feel obliged to name YMac, well, to define it as PMac Plus by himself. So only J. Now, at this point in my presentation, I'm really hoping that no one in the room is going to yell that they, in fact, designed JMac 10 years ago. But barring this, with Bart, we're going to propose, well, this, JMac Mac. So, it takes three inputs. One is the key. Oh, sorry. Ah. One input is the key K. Another input is the message M. The third input is the letter J which is either of A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, Z. And then J Mac of K, M, J is J Mac of K, M. Thank you. And that's it for Max.